reconvene as it's great for like a break in the middle of a seminar. It's like, how about a short five minute break and then 20 minutes later, people are coming in with their coffees and donuts and so. Um, anyway, welcome back. It's uh, my pleasure to uh, introduce uh, my colleague and current C21 fellow, Nathaniel Stern, who will introduce Aaron Manning. Hello, everyone. Thank you. Uh, for those of you who missed the huge welcoming party on Oakland Avenue, um, welcome to Milwaukee. Sorry you missed it. Maybe next time. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be amongst so many humans here, engaging with uh, non-human matter and matter. So I think it's a really important and timely event to look at decentered individuation. So you all get big props and shout outs, or as the case may be, cow clicks. Um, Aaron Manning, uh, and forgive me if you've heard this one before, in my humble opinion, is made of awesome. And it is an absolute privilege to introduce her today. Artist and theorist, friend and collaborator, and Aaron is a professor of philosophy and cinema as well as university research chair in the Faculty of Fine Arts at Concordia University in Montreal. She's the director of the Sense Lab, which explores the intersections between arts practice and philosophy. I first met Erin and was introduced to her work at the International Symposium on Electronic Art in 2010, where her unrehearsed discussion with choreographer Nora Zuniga Shaw inspired um, a wonderful amount of writing, research, and making in my own practice. Her long list of books include, but are not limited to, Ephemeral Territories, Staring Back, Politics of Touch and My Favorite Relationscapes. She is co-editor of the MIT book series Technologies of Lived Extraction and will have two more books released within that series in the coming months or years, depending on how quickly we can turn that around. Erin um, is also currently working on an installation and performance at the Sydney Biennale, among several other international creative projects. But much more important than Erin's long list of accomplishments is her persona. A generous philosopher, an inspired and inspiring artist, an altruistic teacher, and a dedicated and fun collaborator. Erin practices her philosophies. She shares wonder in and with the world that is always just on the cusp of emerging from more than -ness. I'm so glad to have her here, wherever here may refer to Milwaukee Earth, the universe, space, as it were. Her papal entitled Another Regard discusses Don Prince's encounter with the bonobo chimpanzee and continues the work of her co-edited series on Alfred North Whitehead um, by rethinking the question of regard in terms of Whitehead's notion of concern. Concern, she argues, has never added on to a perception. It is the very how of perception. I hope you'll join me in welcoming and appreciating Erin Manning and her work. stupid. I wrote my um, ideas for Brian's talk on the back of my talk, so now I can't read my talk. Um, fortunately, um, um, well, I can always read my notes on Brian. Um, before I, I start, I just wanted to say a few words about, well, first I want to thank Richard, thank Mary, thank Rebecca, thank Nathaniel, thank everyone who's made us feel so welcome here, thank Nirmal and Matt, and, and draw attention for one second to the work uh, created by Nathaniel Stern, Brian Sarah, and myself with collaborators, Brian um, Simeon and Paul Ridgway, which is the work outside um, called Weather Patterns, and I just wanted to say um, a few words about it since um, it has a certain kind of imposing blackness. Um, which actually um, is very different within a museum context. It's totally fascinating to me that having shown a version of the work in Riga where it was treated as a kind of modernist work, I put it up here with Nathaniel and Brian and everybody say, oh wow, it's Halloween! <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, but uh, the, 
the subtitle of the work, um, at least, or the title in my head of the work, it, is Entertaining the Environment. And um, originally, was looking for collaborators to help me conceptualize an interactive art piece that, um, while it didn't exclude the human, didn't make the experience all about the human. And so the work um, works um, by uh, by using all movement in the environment, including electromagnetic movement, the opening of a cell phone, the opening of a computer, including any human movement in the space, including touch. All of these register um, on the sensors, creating a sound stream, which itself responds to itself. It triggers speaker by speaker by speaker. Um, and it creates a wind circuit through these miniature computer fans. Um, the computer fans are very entertaining, but probably more so for mosquitoes than for humans, um, because they don't even manage to move the light string that I hung there. So the idea of the piece is to use human movement to activate a system, but, but not to hold the system to the human. Should you be bored by it, though, since it's not entertaining you per se, I should tell you as well that it's a completely participatory work. So it's, it's based on a collection called Volumetrics, which is um, also a clothing collection. Um, so you can design clothing with it. Um, of course, then you have to rebuild the installation. I'll leave that up to you. All right. Um, so the piece uh, that I'm giving today, is this loud enough? Do I have to stand close or it's fine? is called um, Another Regard. And it begins with a citation by Don Prince, who's, if you don't know Don Prince's work, is an anthropologist who's done a lot of work with gorillas and who has um, also written a couple of memoirs on her experience as an autistic um, dealing with uh, trying to fit into the world and, and how gorillas gave her a place in the world. And so I begin with Don's words. The gorillas regarded me. To them, I had never been away because I had really been there once. Time is different to the gorillas. It is about being together, not about being apart. I am content to feel that kind of time, and I close my eyes and smell deeply the hot leaden smell of gorillas and the thick, sweet smell of hay. First movement. Are you a gorilla? In a piece entitled The Silence Between, Don Prince writes of an encounter with a bonobo chimpanzee, Kanzi, that sets the stage for a rethinking of the deep regard Don Prince shares with apes of all kinds. Having flown to Decatur, Georgia, at the invitation of Sue Savage Rimbo, Prince finds herself alone with Kanzi. She writes, Naturally, I fell into the gorilla language I knew, a language of body, mind, and spirit. Kanzi and I played chase up and down the fence line, both of us on all fours, smiling in a sea of fun and deep breaths. Then something uncanny occurred. Quote, he stopped suddenly and grabbed his word board off the ground. He pointed to a symbol and then pointed to me and made a hand gesture with his eyebrows raised. It was clear that he was asking me a question. He repeated this series of words and movements over and over until I said out loud, I'm sorry, I can't understand, Kanzi. Let me get Sue and maybe she can help me. At first, Sue was at a loss. Then, after asking Kanzi to point to the word again, Sue realized he was pointing to the word gorilla on his board and making the American Sign Language sign for question after pointing to me. It was clear he was asking me if I was a gorilla. What was amazing, though, is that he didn't know American Sign Language. He had, he had seen a video of the gorilla Coco using it and must have not only remembered the signed words, but not having known other gorillas, assumed that all gorillas understood sign language. If I was a gorilla, he thought, this must be a way of communicating that I would understand, end quote. Before I turn to the story in detail, I want to begin with the quote above, where Don Prince writes, the gorillas regarded me. This regard of which she speaks is how I want to frame the engagement with Prince's story, beginning right away with the speculation that the regard about which Prince speaks sets the stage for the encounter with the bonobo Kanzi, shifting it from one of detached observation to one of concern. 
Whitehead's notion of concern is very much about the emphasis on a different notion of regard. Regard not of the subject for the object, or of one individual for another, but of the occasion for its own unfolding. The notion of concern is one way of reworking the dichotomy of subject and object, reinserting them in the event. Whitehead writes, the occasion as subject has a concern for the object, and the concern at once places the object as a component in the experience of the subject, with an affective tone drawn from this object and directed toward it. End quote. The subject does not begin the process. It is the process that activates the subject. Quote, the subject-object relation can be conceived as recipient and provoker, where the fact provoked is an affective tone about the status of the provoker in the provoked experience. Whitehead again. Whitehead adds, quote, the word recipient suggests a passivity, which is erroneous. End quote. Concern is not an intersubjective term, but rather the basis for understanding that experience emerges, quote, through the rise of an affective tone originating from things whose relevance is given. End quote. This is relevant to the story Don recounts for two reasons. First, as I mentioned above, the framing of the event is built on a notion of regard, which foregrounds less an interpersonal stance than an affective tonality. Second, in the event of the regard, there is a slippage in time that undermines a static positioning of subject and object. Whitehead's notion of concern gives us the tools to understand this crafting of time in the relation. Prince writes, to them, I had never been away because I had really been there once. In the event of relation, a concern is emergent that alters the conditions for a regard that, quote, will always have been there once. Recipient and provoker are not to be confused simply with Don and the gorillas, or Don and Kanzi. Recipient and provoker are the myriad affective tonalities of an encounter which stages time and event such that to really have been there once is to have set into motion the conditions for an activation of regard, of concern, which is capable of outliving the immediate occasion. The challenge here is to understand that regard is not something that flows unidirectionally between the human and the animal. What is happening in the first citation is the setting into place of a dynamic relation that foregrounds the movement of time, emphasizing how time is itself a dynamic form that recasts how relation is conceived. When Don writes that to them I had never been away because I had really been there once, it is, of course, Prince's interpretation of the event, but nonetheless, it sets into motion an interesting provocation to the relational field that continues to be foregrounded in the story Prince tells about her encounter with Kanzi. I want to suggest that this notion of regard allows us to reposition the ultimate question, are you a gorilla, away from the interpersonal toward an emphasis on the relational movement that frames the second encounter. Kanzi and I play chase up and down the fence line, both of us on all fours, smiling in a sea of fun and deep breaths, where movement itself becomes the way the event has a concern for its unfolding. Let's replay the event. Don and Kanzi run along a fence, goading one another, moving one another forward in an eight-footed play. First, Don moves with what she knows. Quote, naturally, I fell into the gorilla language I knew, a language of body, mind, and spirit. Don is not mimicking. Her movement comes from an affective attunement based on a long-standing connection to non-human languages. Quote, when I was young, I talked to animals in the language of silence. I knew what trees and streams were saying because they told me. I knew what sow bugs and snakes were saying because they molded me. Sometimes my grandfather would ask me in the garden, what are the worms saying today? Fine, fine, slither, dirt, push, good, rotting, green, I would say, smiling. This, the language of the non-human, is a language that already tunes for dawn to her movement. She listens with movement, listens to how it expresses in the now of the encounter. She knows the welling event, has regard for this movement, this expression in the moving of the more than of human experience. Kanzi, in turn, plays with the language of movement she proposes. 
Quote both of us on all four, smiling in a sea of fun and deep breaths. Don and Kanzi cueing, aligning, creating a rhythm in counterpoint, gorilla like. William Forsyth defines counterpoint as, quote, a field of action in which the intermittent and irregular coincidence of attributes between organizational elements produces an ordered interplay, end quote. This definition of counterpoint emphasizes the relationship between movement and time. Forsyth speaks of choreographing the future in the present moving, asking his dancers to, quote, dance where the other dancer is going, to, quote, meet him there. Dancing in an alignment with futures in the making suggests a structured improvisation that is attuned to the incipient more than of movement, movement's technicity. To move into the technicity of movement is not to mimic or predict. There is no standing back from the event in the moving. It is to move with the movement's excess of position. It is to craft movement moving in the more than of movements taking form. This happens in counterpoint as dancers, quote, shift each other's time. That's Forsyth. Forsyth explains, Sinking is not what's important in the sense of matching an already known timing. Move in the time frames of the becoming movement. Pre-accelerate into the relational field activated by movement moving. Move with the affective tonality with future time presenting. Quote, this can operate in different time frames. Go slower, be in another's past right before they catch up to you. Then move past them to their future. Look for the moment. Aim at it, rather than going directly to it, William Forsyth. Counterpoint is not the activity of an individual body. It is the activity of a relational field through which movement moves. Movement moving is intensively distributed, always beyond its simple location, as Whitehead would say. In counterpoint, the movement exceeds the frame, the frame of time, the frame of the skin envelope, activating an inframobility that tunes to a relational movement. As collective movement becomes attuned to this relational field, time folds, individual movements no longer abstractable from the whole. One movement moving in difference, counterpoint. The one is, of course, always more than one. It is an infinity of movement speciations. Speciations make dancing body not the other way around. We no longer have one, two, three bodies moving. We have an affective attunement. This affective attunement cannot be measured in linear time. It happens in a time continuously folding into the intervals created by the moving field. This time of movement moving is felt by the dancers as a, move, as a moment of uncanny synchronicity. Synchronous because the movements create a collective experience of time shaping. Strange, because the collective movement is slightly off, attuned to, but in the difference of movement's capacity to invent, creating an ordered interplay, as Forsyth would say, yes, but something more as well, a sense of having been transported into the more than by the event. A field of counterpoint has been created. Any repetition of the exercise of counterpoint will necessarily create a different field, each counterpoint event makes its own time. Counterpoint's intermittent and irregular coincidence of, attribute, of attributes agitate the field of action at the level of speciations. In the case of Don and Kanzi, it is not two fully constituted body envelopes that dance, but a multiplicity of body tendings moving in their difference. Speciations in the moving, finger, ground, spine, Extension, rotation, bend. Metal, fur, breath. What agitates is a body likeness, a field of relations that does not mimic a body, but creates a bodying in a shifting co-composition of experiential space-times. Vonicsku speaks of, fighter, of spiders that are of flyers, <laughs> of spiders that are fly-like, of cups that are coffee-like. These are speciations. Compositional tendencies active in the relational field their coming into eventness calls forth. Quote, to be fly-like means that the spider has taken up certain elements of the fly in its constitution. Better expressed, 
The fly likeness of the spider means that it has taken up certain motifs of the fly, of the fly melody in its bodily composition. Everywhere, it is the counterpoint which expresses itself as a motif in such configurations." End quote. The dancer's movement was perhaps spiral-like, wall-like, sound-like, connecting not directly to another body, but to a sounding, a spiraling, a levitating, gravitational field. Heavy to the ground meets laughter in movement, gorilla-like. Speciations are rhythmic activations of a body morphing that never precede the event of their coming into relation. They give rhythm, give tone to the how of the events in forming. Cutting across species fully formed, connected as they are in the milieu of the relational activation. In the event of Don and Kanzi, to take these two first as the bonobo and the human, would be to engage in the practice of placing the subject outside the event ignoring the force of speciation. It would be to take the notion of species as a given and assume that all encounters are framed by species already fully formed. This is a brand of identity politics. Before we can know how to approach the question, are you a gorilla, we must know who you really are. Are you a captive gorilla, an autistic woman, a philosopher, an animal activist, a zookeeper, an anthropologist? While all of these criteria make a difference to how the event unfolds, there is no suggestion here that there aren't asymmetrical power relations. To posit identity politics as a starting point of the process is to background and advance the activity of the meteor's rhythmic informing, and even more importantly, to undermine the potential of a coming, if not to a different answer, at least to a different way of framing the question. For to begin with identity politics is always to assume to know in advance how to frame an answer to a question of belonging, of territory, of identity. To frame the, ev the event in advance of its unfolding with markers of identity, obviously she is not a gorilla, clearly Kanzi is misrecognizing, is to sidestep the act of the events unfolding as event. For who can know yet what constitutes gorilla in this context? of movement counterpoint. All movement is, to some degree, counterpoint. Movement rhythms, it connects, prolongs, undermines, subverts, dances, it never stops. Movement is always of multiple valences. There is absolute movement, the durational field of movement moving, which envelops all worldings. Counterpoint cuts into absolute movement to create an actualizable field, an ordered interplay. And in doing so, counterpoint touches on both registers of movement, virtual and actual, tapping into the field of total movement to create an opening for this or that movement quality in the realm of the actual. This allows the milieu of movement to resonate with the more than. This more than is the counterpoint events motif. This motif is a likeness. It gives the milieu a singular tonality. This tone in turn tunes the milieu to certain tendencies. A milieu with a springing motif tunes to air likeness, for instance. Or, as, Fernixker's, as in Fernixker's example, fly likeness tunes not to fly a species, but to a qualitative likeness of a fly movement intensively in rhythm with the spider's web. This likeness is first and foremost affective. It is an attunement not simply to the fly in its quantitative dimensions or in its behaviors, but to the way its singular movement tendencies affect the speciation spider-like. Fonixka writes, the web, but never the fly, can be called the goal of forming the web. But the fly does indeed serve as the counterpoint for the formation of the web. A speciation is not, as such, organic. It is not made up of separately definable human and animal components in a metonymic relation to an organic whole. This very idea of the organic whole is a misnomer. Both, quote, body and, quote, species are general categories. They can only be conceived as such by divesting them of the relational field which co-constitutes them. To posit such a notion of the whole is to have separated out the event of bodying from its activity. Speciations are how to think this activity, the inact of body world constellations, in all their organic and inorganic intermixings. These inacts are not strictly physical. They are a conglomeration of physicalities with affective tonalities that emerge, 
that emerge from the very necessity of the milieu. It is the milieu that fashions them. Speciations body in the event of their direct correlation to the event. They are not body species preformed and are never finally formed. They are bodyings. An event has concern for the bodying, and there is no body that is not infinitely more than one. An autonomy of expression is at work in the relational field speciations call forth. We are not talking of relations that exist outside the event of their emergence. The relational field of movement moving activates the distributed field in which the dancers dance. And in the dancing, they move with it, aligning to it, moving it. The field expresses. The field dances to attention, not the dancers as individuals. And what it expresses is a relational movement that exceeds the terms of the dancer's individual bodiness, bringing into complex constellations a rhythm that informs the speciations their movement moving creates. Second movement, at play. The dynamic form gorilla-like is bred in play. Don and Kanzi run on all fours along a fence, laughing, grunting. There is no outside to their game. It is not meant for anyone else. Play is unselfconscious, improvisation, spontaneity mixed in with the constraints of incipient territorializations, the fence, the time of day, the newness of the encounter with the gestures, with gestures no doubt at first quizzical, careful, and then perhaps engaged, untroubled even at times. Instinct, some people would say. Art, others would respond. Counterpoint is created. It proposes an assemblage, and this assemblage is always, to a degree, a territorializing platform. But what counterpoint also does is keep that territory moving, active, transductive. For counterpoint activates the associated milieus of the territory, the milieus that cross through it and are always, to some extent, in excess of it. This is the paradox of counterpoint. It must remain territorial to the degree that it can be accessed and returned to. But what is returned to is always, to a certain degree, different. The field of counterpoint is dynamic, its movements local, in insofar as they co-constitute the singular expression of emergence their in-concertness calls forth, and global to the degree that they can be recaptured for future events in the making. Counterpoint produces not positions as such, but the more than of position on its way to activating times as yet unseen, unfelt, positions outdoing themselves in concert. Territories play undoes the dichotomy between speciations and species, locating them not as opposites, but on a continuum. For speciations are complex aggregates. They, they affect on a multitude of strata, including that of the species, elasticizing the territory even as they move in concert with it. It's not that there is no longer a bonobo and a human. It's that the event never begins there. It begins in movement, in the mobility of relation, where there is always more than this particular species combination. For as soon as the territory becomes an active milieu, it becomes a field of movement constellations. Species is a general category, always abstracted from the movement of the event. What is concretely in act is never the general category. This is why starting with a general category cannot yield nuanced results. Take, for instance, the question of gender. When, while gendering or engendering a speciation has many roles to play in an event such as that between Kanzi and Don, gender posited as a preformed category cannot make sense of their encounter without imposing a framing device onto the event, onto the event from the outside. This has the effect of backgrounding the inact of the event, losing sight of the intricate complexities of the events acting out. For instance, a general statement about the general category woman in relation to Dawn would immediately connect her body to a certain set of qualities or criteria that would mediate the event of her encounter with Kanzi, who as a male would then be expected to respond in certain often stereotyped ways. What is concretely in act, I want to suggest, is never a gender, but an engendering, a coming into itself of a singular set of relations, 
of which male likeness and female likeness may be defining elements, but always only in their inactness, in tandem with co-constitutive elements active in the associated milieu. This engendering opens the field to new constellations, some of which may be allied to gender, others of which may constitute forms of speciation not yet defined and categorized. Back to the fence and to the art of play. Quote, we consider that an animal in a complex and accidental milieu would have few chances of survival if he could only use stereotyped behavior even if more or less corrected by orienting stimuli. Much more important are the improvised responses directed to the stimuli that act as a sort of irritant, not as a signal. From Pillier, who's also in Brown's paper. We didn't write these at the same time, but we obviously lived in them. Animals play, and play is an art, as Brian Masumi underlines, precisely because instinct, conceived as artless, is, as he writes, downright maladaptive. It's stereotyping forbidding a response tailored to the singularity of the situation. Following Rie, Masumi suggests that at play, a processional trigger spurs a creative advance, an imminent modification. The stimulus irritates, he writes, provokes, stirs. It is a processional inducer. What it most directly induces is an integral modification in the tendential self-consistent self-consistency of animal experience correlated to the externality of an accident-rich environment, but governed by its own stern logic of qualitative variation. Instinct, as Bergson writes, is played more than it is represented. It is too simplistic, then, to suggest that what moves Kanzi or what moves Don is simply behavior predating the event, such as instinct tied to, tied to gender or species categories. They are not imitating or responding to something that predefines them. They are creating play. Gorilla-like is an art. No gorilla has actually entered the scene. What has entered is a movement constellation that has taken both Don and Kanzi by surprise. Gorilla-like is the more than of their coming together the motif of the event's counterpoint. And although it is spoken in the language of the third, the sign language of, of the gorilla, it erupts in the language of counterpoint, the language of movement's possession by itself. The movement moves the gorilla-like speciation of which Kanzi and Don, in a million variations, are part. Paw, earth, foot, air, laughter, dirt, grunt, metal, all of these speciations are at work in dancing the emergent counterpoint. There is no purpose to play except to create more play, to create more desire for play. Are you a gorilla? Is this event of play's postscript, not its mandate? If we take it as the starting point, the question of subjectivity will become the framing device for the event. I am, you are, a question of species. Play will be undone of precisely what makes it play. It will become a rehearsal of something that exceeds it in advance. This is not what happens here. Play between Kanzi and Don is the feeling of a relational movement, and it is out of this improvisatory feel that the question, are you a gorilla, emerges, not the other way around. It is not a general category gorilla which is at stake here, but the gorilla of play's motif, and the way the motif makes ingression into the newly formed constellation, gorilla-like. Third movement, on novelty. <laughs> Life means novelty, writes Whitehead. To have that kind of confidence, that life means novelty. Life is an appetition, appetite for the more than. Life always in tune with a life, Deleuze's concept of a life. The force of life living across the organic and inorganic realms where speciations converge to create territories of difference. To restrict life to the physical plane, as Whitehead notes, is to starkly underestimate the play of its capacity for invention. Whitehead has a strange name for the force of appetition that activates the more than of life living. He calls it reason. Reason, for Whitehead, is another word for the force of thought that is imminent to the event. When you read Whitehead's book on reason, it's such a fantastic critique of Kant, and yet he doesn't seem to need to say it. Um, this force of thought is never thought as that which lands onto the event from outside its concrescence. It is the reason of nature. 
in nature, a concern with the very edges of the thinkable in its non-alignment to consciousness. For Whitehead, nature thinks. When Whitehead says that nature is, quote, impenetrable by thought, what he means is that thought does not enter into nature from the outside to orchestrate it from without. Nature is not a passive element to be mediated, and nor is thought a mediating activity. Nature creates thought, a thinking in the event. This thinking makes ingress into the event in large part through the constellations speciations take. Nature and speciations are co-combinatory. They cannot be taken separately. The question is never, as Whitehead underscores, quote, what is in the mind and what is in nature? The question is, how is gorilla-like? How does nature's play move life living, creating thought? Nature's play is never separate from the event of its coming into being, in the same way that the occasion of experience is never preceded by an already composed notion of space or time. Nature is its speciations, active always in the time of the event's making. Nature is thus never in itself, in the same way that a species, a body, an individual, are never solely in themselves. Nature is a relational field through which certain motifs become active, motifs which in turn activate new fields of relation in the time of the event. It is, in all of its eventness, a multitude of modes of existence, a field of creativity. Key to what Whitehead calls the creative advance is what he terms self-enjoyment, the concern the event has for its coming to subjective form. Quote, the notion of life implies a certain absoluteness of self-enjoyment, where each occasion of experience is an individual act of immediate self-enjoyment. Okay. Self-enjoyment is not a moral category. It is not about the enjoyment of this or that, not the enjoyment of the subject for life, but the enjoyment of life in the event of life living. Life living, it bears reminding, as the continuous outdoing of any notion of life in itself, or nature in itself. Self-enjoyment is the occasion's concern for its own process, a process that always includes a certain more than. This more than, as mentioned above, is brought forth by the event's capacity to exceed what Whitehead calls its physical pull. The physical pull is a concept in Whitehead that denotes the most bare aspect of the occasion, a concept that is inseparable from the adjacent notion of the mental pull, or what he's here called reason, which he defines as the how of the creative advance. Mentality, the, the mental pull, Whitehead defines as a factor of intensity in experience, moves the event beyond its physical pull. Quote, when the species refuses adventure, there is a relapse into the well-attested habit of a mere life. Varied freshness has been lost, and the species lives upon the blind appetitions of odd usages. Whitehead. If the physical pull were all that were at stake, and if life were merely about a passive overcoming of the interests of self-preservation, there would be no creativity, and certainly no reinvention of life. Again, it is necessary to move beyond the thought of this or that human or animal life. Life here touches on all that has capacity for transition. It is life living, a life, speciation, in exquisite more than human configurations. Novelty abounds, a novelty spurred by the complex of self-enjoyment, appetition, mentality. Think mentality is the event's thinking feeling, as Masumi might say. A feltness in the thinking resonant at the edges of experience. Each occasion dances with this not yet. It's becoming always in counterpoint with the more than of its will have been. Time folding, recall, foresight, dance into future movement. Mentality is perhaps the wrong word for this intensive process, if Whitehead will forgive me for that, this organ of novelty or urge beyond. For despite this not being the case, mentality, like its earlier counterpoint, reason, still sounds as though it is in the mind or of consciousness. We might therefore simply call it a thinking feeling, emphasizing how it is an activity in the event that co-composes with the occasion's physicality to create, in the act, a contributory more than that emphasizes how novelty is a process of thought in the doing. The force of appetition, as mentioned above, could be another good term for mentality in that it emphasizes the hunger of a process which opens the occasion to, no to novel motifs 
activating in the occasion, a, as Whitehead would say, a factor of anarchy. I should say here that Whitehead has, has a definition of appetition and the definition of mentality, so I'm not saying that they're the same for Whitehead, but I am saying that perhaps the force of appetition is similar to the thinking, feeling, or to mentality, if you also have the problem I have, but it's hard to sort of keep undoing mentality when you're trying to think it from some notion that we have of mental. If that's not a problem, then hold on to mentality, of course. This is not to say that creative advance is active all the time under all circumstances. It is to emphasize that the force of appetition and thinking feeling are always present in germ and contributory in the dynamic form of events concreting. Whitehead writes, the quality of an active experience is largely determined by the factor of the thinking it contains. As soon as a process falls into general categories, its capacity for creative events is stunted, for general categories don't think. Creativity is always in the dynamic details of a process. These details are played out at the level of the emergent occasion in the constellation of the event. They are its speciations, its technicities, its over-articulations, its pre-accelerations. They are the events more than. This is where the thinking feeling happens, in the act of the events outdoing a form, in the inact of the events outdoing a simple location. Movement moving. Fourth movement and last movement, and incomplete movement. Whitehead writes, the community of actual things is an organism, but it is not a static organism. It is an incompletion in process of production. Katzi and Don meet, play ensues. Their movement moves them, connecting them at the level of speciations that exceed them as individuals. In the speciation, a counterpoint emerges. This emergent counterpoint is a structured improvisation, it moves into the habitual movements brought into play at the same time as it connects to a generative field of movement moving. The generative force of movement in counterpoint activated in the movie creates a motif. This prolongs the dance, giving it a style all its own. This style exceeds Don or Conzi's individuals, exceeds their habitual ways of moving. A relational movement has emerged. This relational movement is a field experience. Everything is concretely at play. The quality of air, the sound of breath on metal, on fur, on skin, the feel of paws on earth, on cement, the heaviness of limbs at clay, the grumblings of stomachs, the pull of muscles, the rustlings of fallen leaves. Everything singularly contributes. And in this field teeming with activity, a question is drawn. Are you a gorilla? This is not a question intended to be answered. It is a motif. It is a platform to spring from through which new movement constellations can take flight. Gorilla-like is a new concept. New concepts, when they really do their work, activate speciations, which in turn affect how societies evolve. Whitehead defines a society as a type of order, a nexus, endurance. He writes, an animal body is a society involving a vast number of occasions, spatially and temporally coordinated. Each living body is a society. This is the force of concepts that they insist, they irritate, they agitate in the cross-fertilization of occasions and societies. These agitations play out on the level of the occasion, but as the occasion perishes onto the nexus, they also affect the contributive realm, for they constitute, for they continue to make ingress. Concepts res resonate transversely, creating a vibratory field that affects how future events are composed. They feed the future presenting with their appetite. For more. They are counterpoint machines. They create a field of action which provokes a coincidence of attributes to produce the excess of an ordered interplay. Gorilla like. The complex relational field of movement moving courses across the societies Don and Kanzi. These societies are altered by the process, as are all of the contributory forces that have made their way into the event. These contributory forces touch on the many stories the event calls forth each one of them now tainted by the motif, gorilla-like. Take the story of Kanzi, born October 28, 1980, a bonobo chimpanzee raised in captivity, for whom contact has been for the most part restricted to the human. Infuse the story into the event and consider how gorilla-like reframes it, foregrounding, perhaps, the fact that Kanzi's, quote, advanced linguistic aptitude has made language the vehicle for communication since he was a baby. For not only does he use lexigrams, 
but he can also understand aspects of spoken language and associate it with the lexigrams. No surprise, then, that gorilla-like emerges in the speaking as much as it does in the movie. Take the story of Don Prince, born January 31, 1964, an autistic fighting for a place in a world tuned to, a neurotypical, to neurotypical modes of encounter that continuously, painfully set her apart. Infuse this story into the event and consider how Gorilla Life speaks to the force of another regard, something Prince has honed in her years of working with gorillas, gorillas whom she feels have a regard for her. These are some of the societies, in brief, that meet on that fateful afternoon to play along the fence. The contributory force of a society on an individual occasion is not quantitatively measurable. Ingression is not about quantitative content per se. It is about the tuning of an occasion towards certain kinds of activations of the past in the present for future presenting. In the case of this singular encounter, one tendency that makes ingression into the event I want to suggest is the question of regard tuned as it is to the reciprocity of what I have elsewhere called autistic perception. But first, let me insist. Autistic perception is a tendency in perception on a continuum with all perception, not a definition of autism. It is a style that has been remarked upon by the many autistics with whom I've collaborated, a perceptual style that actively thinks, feels the edgings and contourings of fields of relation coagulating into instances of shaped experience. What makes autistic perception valuable for the rethinking of experience is the slowness of what Anne Corwin calls chunking. Anne Corwin White writes, quote, I often tend to sit on floors and other surfaces, even if furniture is available because it's a lot easier to identify, quote, flat surface a person can sit on than it is to sort the environment into chunks like couch, chair, floor, and coffee table. All perception involves chunking. But what autistics have access to that is usually backgrounded for neurotypicals is the direct experience of the relational fields morphing into subjects and objects. Experientially speaking, there is never, for anyone, the direct apprehension of an object or a subject. What we perceive is always, first, a relational field. It is a key contribution of Whitehead to have created a whole philosophical vocabulary of process to make this clear. Still, given the quickness of the morphing from the relational field into the objects and subjects of our perceptions, many of us feel as though the world is pre-chunked into species, into bodies, and individuals. This is the shortcoming, as autistics might say, of neurotypical perception that we are simply too quick to chunk. And it is certainly one of the things that makes many autistics feel lost in a world overtaken by normal paths. The foregrounding of the world in its morphability as experience in autistic perception opens experience to a level of relation with the world which is rare. This level of relation is an ecological attunement to the multiplicity that is life-living. For it attends always to the dynamic details of a process Autistic perception never begins with the general attribute, never assumes integration over complexity. It prehends always from the middle, with an active regard for the emergent field's environmentality. In the register of autistic perception, the world is experienced always as an ecology of practices, in the complex relations of, it, of its emergent unfoldings. This is a language of experience that moves not from self to self or self to other, but from dynamic constellation to dynamic constellation. As autistic Tito Mukapare writes, maybe I do not have to try very hard to be the wind or a, wind or a rain cloud. There is a big sense of extreme connection I feel with a stone or perhaps with a pen on a tabletop or a tree. There is no separation. Cloud life, rock life. If we ignore the non-human centered valence of Prince's or Mukapare's approach and persist in placing the human at the forefront as the motivating force of all events, their words will seem anthropomorphic. We will read Prince's encounter with Kamsi simply as a human once more telling the story of an animal in human terms. We will interpret Mukapada as giving a human face to the pen, to the tabletop, to the tree. Autistic perception warns us against its approach, however, persistently reminding us not to begin with the pre-chunked. Begin in the middle, it says. Don't assume to know in advance how the chunking will resolve. 
It seems to me that we should heed these words and learn from them, with them, that we might listen more intently to how the world composes itself in a mode of perception which does not privilege the human in any of its precomposed guises or any other general categories. But let us not stop there. The accusation of anthropomorphism, whether misplaced, as in the case of Kanzi and Don, or fitting in other instances, need not be reason for us to return to our old habits of generalizing and categorizing. For is it not true that the accusation of anthropomorphism has become one more way of not attending to the complex counterpoint of the creative events? As Jane Bennett writes, a touch of anthropomorphism can catalyze a sensibility that finds a world filled not with ontologically distinct categories of beings, subjects, and objects, but with variously composed materialities that form confederations. Maybe it is worth running the risks associated with anthropomorphizing, because, oddly, because it, oddly enough, works against anthropocentrism. A chord is struck between a person and a thing, and I am no longer above or outside a non-human environment. There is counterpoint in infinite abundance, and we are not hearing it, let alone dancing it. Ecologies of perception are backgrounded by an overarching emphasis on general categories. New modes of attention are needed, and persistent efforts to experience the novelty of life living are essential to enjoying the complexity of worldlings that populate us. Populates us. The more pressing question is not whether or not an engagement with the more than human is anthropomorphic. But what exactly it is that has led us to the certainty we seem to have that the world can be parsed out into objects and subjects? And how intertwined this assertion has become with a notion of interactivity that sets itself up not as a radical empiricism, but as a mediating interplay between already existing terms. And I'm thinking here of interact of course. James' mantra bears repeating, quote, the relations that connect experiences must themselves be experienced must themselves be experienced relations, and any kind of relation experience must be accounted as real as anything else in the system. There is no object in itself, just as there is no subject only for itself. To cite Whitehead again, the occasion has a concern for the object, and the concern at once places the object as a component in the experience of the subject, with an affective tone drawn from this object and toward it. Subjects and objects edge into experience relationally, not human relationally, but in an incipient relation that species. To suggest, as Levy Bryant does, that all objects are, indep are independent of one another, or to espouse a theory of object irreducibility, as Graham Harmon does, brings objects back fully formed onto themselves, with relation positioned outside as extra to the event's concrescence. The in itselfness of the object or the animal must, re must be resisted as strongly as the in itselfness of the human. Neither human nor object nor animal comes to experience fully formed. It is the counterpoint of their speciation that is at stake in experience. This, it seems to me, is what can be taken wholesale from Kanzi's and Prince's dance. Speciations connect, cutting transversely across all genera, meeting at the level of intensities, motifs, creating styles in the moving, an ecology of practices, a mode of existence, an activist philosophy. Don Prince writes, I hope that autistic people and others that have been beyond understanding until recently will be the natural interpreters of an important patois. The patois of which Prince speaks is a language replete with the sensitivity of autistic perception, thick with the force of thought in the middling of its expressibility, textured by a more than future movements and unchunked experiences, ripe for the infralinguistic telling. The incomplete answer to, are you a gorilla, is spoken in such a patois, a language that can only be heard in the moving, in the infra of positioning, in the choreographic thinking that is always in the beyond of subject and object. This is the challenge, to move in counterpoint with a language that trembles on the edges of understanding, to become as autistically perceptive as possible, even at the risk of losing our footing in a species-oriented world, and gaining our footing in a world of speciation, to participate in the concern for another regard.
Don't worry, you were the only one that turned <laughs> so, well, you, you, you characterize actual occasions of actual entities as entirely uh, derived from their relations. Uh, and it, it sort of speaks to uh, you know, a broader kind of contemporary intellectual context that's really there. And this is particularly uh, Stephen C. Chen Bates, who is a very common. He's argued, Stephen's argued, that the, the fact that the entity makes a decision does grant this a certain level of super relational autonomy. Uh, and so there, I think there's a, a certain tension even in the kind of deal way. I think you can't possibly, I don't know, maybe just a comment on that. There's a second question. Um, the thing that you were referring to as concepts, uh, way that also refers to as um, yeah, eternal objects, and he um, basically indicates them with Plato's forms, and he says that God has arranged them into a grid iron pattern that never changes at all and that exists outside of time. Um, and so there, it seems you also have a kind of super relational component to Whitehead's ontology as well. Something that's kind of withdrawn, has a certain level of relevance to our reality, but it's not actually here right now. And in that sense, like, this entire universe seems kind of like a big object. Um, and so maybe it's kind of like, you know, yeah, I actually don't think Steve and I disagree, but Steve, you can disagree with me if you want. I, uh, <laughs> I think that, um, and this is often actually a conversation Brian and I have, and, and of course Steve is often part of our conversations even when he's in Detroit, um, it, which is that uh, with process philosophy, um, so many of us work on, on these um, microscopic details that are really focusing on different moments of the process. And so when we're speaking of, of the decision aspect of a process, we're talking about the subjective form. And I was actually not talking about the subjective form here, except when I was speaking about territoriality, um, simply because I was trying to work out the idea of counterpoint. So I was actually speaking, if you had to draw that line, which is extremely difficult to do in a topological system, about the emergent, um, the, 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 the speciation, the force of emergence that, that um, the prehension creates to, to form an occasion. But of course, as, as we all know, if we're all, all of us who have uh, made our way through Whitehead, the, the, the force of Whitehead is the atomism of the occasion. The occasion has to be atomistic in order to make Alberum in the universe, as he says, in order for the, the, there to be this contributing factor toward other occasions. So I actually don't think that we're, we're in disagreement about that at all. I just think that, and, and this is often, also happens with readings of Deleuze and Guattari, where where um, different aspects of the intervention can be dealt with and, and, and can seem like they're pulling on the elastic really, t really in different ways. But I think that what Deleuze and Atari do and what Whitehead do is, is give us limit concepts to allow us to think the process um, across them. And eternal objects are, are something I've written about quite a bit. Um, they come up a lot in my work because they're really relevant to both um, art and to dancing. Um, and Whitehead often talks about uh, eternal objects in relation to color. So, you know, I'm just saying this for those of you who don't know about Whitehead's eternal objects. He'll talk about the quality, for example, of redness. And you can, you can, for those of you who know Guattari, Deleuze and Guattari better, I think there's definitely a link to Hexaidi in the way that, that they work with Hexaidi and saying a thousand plateaus. But, um, so, I would disagree a little bit with your reading of eternal objects. And I would say, or is that understanding you reading them? And say that the, 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 the force of the relational object, or the knowability of the, uh, the eternal object, is how it makes ingress into the event. So as an abstract concept, you can't really do much with, a, with an eternal object. Um, because there is no place, I think, in Whitehead's philosophy for something that isn't an occasion. Um, there is no outside to the occasion. There's not some kind of super world somewhere else. Um, I mean, we've had a discussion about God, but I'd rather not do that because that's my big weakness in my head. But um, uh, so uh, what I would say is that is that what so, so that each occasion activates in different ways relational objects, which are absolute in the sense that red is red is red is red. But how red makes ingress into the event is obviously um, absolutely variable. Um, so, you know, in this case, um, if I were to have talked about, about eternal objects, I might have talked about certain 
certain very specific kinds of movement practices that, that lead to, to certain modes of recognition of through the like, for example. But um, it's, I find eternal objects, even though I love them as concepts, I find them a bit like mentality, that you have to spend so much time explaining how they're not eternal and how they're not objects, that by the time you've done that, you know, you've had to invent a whole new terminology. Um, so I only do like a chapter on eternal objects and then a chapter on mentality to not kill the reader. But anyway, so I hope that makes sense. Maybe we can talk further. Yeah. Hey, Jane. Uh -huh. Hi. Thanks for that talk. Um, my question is based pretty much on ignorance of Whitehead, so it's kind of a question um, of, for clarification. And I've heard a lot of people give narratives that are Whiteheading in process, and I've read a little bit of Whitehead, but not deeply. Um, and each time I hear the story, as I hear your story about um, movement event and it's all very persuasive until, but a little bit, what rankles with me is the emphasis on novelty. And um, I, I'm hoping that you could explain to me why, why the emphasis on, what role that plays in the process, the novelty, as opposed to something like, um, I wrote here, um, material tendencies spinning themselves out in large, though not infinite number of ways of iterated meanings, and you do talk about the, cons the constraints of the, the fence and the two-legged bodies, and you know. So you do talk about that, but but when I hear that the story, it seems like it just doesn't ring true to me. All that novelty it seems like that part's overstated. Unless I misunderstand what what is you know denoted by the novelty yeah. thing. And I'm wondering whether just the last bit is maybe maybe I don't like I said this is based on ignorance of Whitehead, but. Um, it sounds like when Whitehead talks about the physical or the material, he might flatten that out a bit, such that he has to, maybe that allows him to kind of play out the, 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 the radical novelty component. Mm -hmm. so I just wonder if you could speak to that. Yeah, I mean, I think that the, the um, I should say, you know, this is what I just gave is the last chapter of the book, so <laughs> you know how you do all of that in the other chapters, and then by the time you get the last chapter, you're not doing any of that work anymore. There, this, it's a really, really relevant question, and I come up uh, against it. He uses novelty and creativity in similar ways. So I'll start with that, and then if I forget the, the second question, which I've already forgotten, which was... About maybe flattening out flattening the physical, physical pole. Yeah. Yeah. So they're linked. So in the way that I read Whitehead, and of course I hope we have you know a million divergent readings of Whitehead, because I think... Um, process can be read in, in so many different ways. Um, I, I think you have to understand, however you call it, you have to bring in the concept of speciation. And, and so what, you, what novelty is, is not something never seen before. It has nothing to do with the kind of capitalist notion of novelty. It has to do with, with, with a different constellation, literally. So, so how, um, it's, it has to do a lot with the planning that Brian was talking about before. So how an event comes into itself will always be different. There is, no rep there is no possible repetition of an event, even if it's at the level of the molecular. I mean, there, there, there is no one thing that will infinitely repeat itself the same way. Um, and so what, what Whitehead does, and, and you know, I could just you know, draw you to his book on reason, which is the function of reason where he really talks about this, is he says, well, if there was no novelty, then that would suggest a system that, that basically just died eventually, that, that would just kind of roll into itself to, 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 to disappear. Um, and, and we know that isn't the case. There's always difference. Something always happens. And so the question is, how does this occur? How, what, what spurs this? And, and he doesn't actually, again, it's sort of the, the same problem I have with Whitehead, or it's not a problem, but the difficulty with Whitehead I have with those and Kutari, that that in order to frame, I think, that the, the complexity of the process, he has to have these limit terms which in this case are mentality and the physical, but he never thinks of them separately. So it's not that um, a human has mentality and a rock has physicality at all. The rock has mentality as much as, as the human has physicality. It's really about the degree, right? So, so the rock prehends time, for example, in its disintegration. It has a degree of engagement. It, it, it isn't an ecological conversation, right? Um, the, the question is absolutely not to make that separation from the rock to the human, but rather to ask how the coincidences, how they form an ecology, what, what does that speciation look like, or what does it do even more interestingly. So in my understanding, in my reading of Whitehead, there isn't at all a flattening out. In fact, there's such a concept reading of materiality that, that I don't even call it materiality anymore because I wouldn't know how to, 
how to make it both inorganic and organic at the same time, which I think it, it's always coursing through, right? And so that's why, for me, the idea of chunking becomes really interesting, because when, when there's an autistic perception, I mean, this is how the autistics talk about going into a room, literally. And they say, well, the, you guys see the chairs right away. They emerge from me after five minutes. I don't see them right away, right? And so this pushes me to think, wow, this, this what seemed like a material object, what seemed so clear to me, isn't even perceptible. You know, within the first minute of, of you know me going into a room with with Tito, for example. So, so, so something that I understand as materiality um, is actually a, a much more complex speciation of, of certain kinds of materials, perhaps, and time, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, I don't know if that begins to answer, but yeah, I'll just say I, I wasn't so much focusing on on the chunking, which I thought was a really good point. Right. Um, more on even the autistic person. There's repetitions and there's patterns and there's swirls and they repeat and not always the same. But for me, that process of changing the, the notion of novelty seems too strong. Yeah, you know, I think it's a little bit like reading Suzanne Langer. Um, you know, Whitehead was writing a long time ago. I mean, you know, this is 1929, eh? So I think that it, it, it's useful for me. I, novelty only comes up in this chapter. It's useful for me to think creativity because. It is a word that comes up in art a lot, and 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 I want to make a difference between the idea that the artist has to um, come up with the newest new all of the time, and talk about how the artist is actually reorienting um, in order to uh, accentuate a process. So weather patterns does it, creating a weather pattern is what's happening outside. It's raining, you know. Like I'm only trying to do something that is already happening elsewhere, right? So. In those terms, novelty is interesting, but only if you take it as that. I think if, if the term is is like n niggling, then then I would say wow, because it's actually not that important to what I'm trying to do. What's more important, I think, is is for me is really trying to get out of the identity politics and in that kind of old uh, narrative that says that we already know who Don might be or who Kanzi might be, right? That's, yeah. Um, I've got a question about the, the interspecies encounter that your paper is uh, yeah. anchored on. Um, because uh, up they say there, the long interview with, with the Liz, um A stands for animal yeah. animals. And he uh, professes his um, uh, sheer hatred of pets. Um, and I'm not saying that we have to you know, follow the Liz all across the line, but he hates it when people talk to their cats and dogs. Uh, he just uh, abhors the fact that we make animals do stupid tricks. Uh, for him, it's not a, a question of uh, preserving the authenticity of a certain species in the wild. It's just that it, it shows the stupidity of anthropocentrism and the stupidity of believing that we can encounter um, animals on their own terms. So, um, to what extent was, was the bonobo domesticated? Oh, was, she a, okay. was, was he a pet? Um, and, and if so, if he was a pet, um, what does that tell us about uh, about the propensity for such interspecies ethics? Yeah, wow. You're going to have to write a whole other book to answer that question. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, I have, I have cats, so I'm going to have to disagree with Deleuze, you know, which it doesn't often happen to me, and say that, that anybody who lives with animals, I think, knows that they are, they are totally other, no matter how much you try to domesticate them. Um, or at least cats, I mean. But I, I, I often... <laughs> and uh, um, what I often notice living with cats is that what they do is they complicate the, the vertical, horizontal axis of the household. Because cats are always moving at different levels, right? And they're, they're actually always moving you. I mean, anybody who's tried to build, renovate, do anything important, be in a hurry, any of those things, the cat will be up at your feet, right? So um, my tendency is, and that's what I said earlier, that I don't want to underestimate asymmetrical power relations. I, I once gave a version of this paper, and you know, the whole conversation was about there being a fence. I am not saying that there is no fence, obviously. Um, but I'm trying to get at something else, which is the question of counterpoint. And I think that that the question, when Kanti asks the question, are you a gorilla, he's 
definitely getting beyond some kind of instrumental pet owner relationship. I mean, he didn't even learn sign language as far as they knew. He picked it up because they showed him the video, right? So I think that um, uh, what I would want to, if I were to write that book, which would be a fun book to write, I would want to maybe be careful about assuming a kind of natural versus domesticated difference. But talk about nature in the complex way that I was that comes out of Whitehead that's coming out here, and and go toward what Ryan was doing in in um, you know that 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 line of abstraction that Ryan was trying to draw that is always folding in and through with with certain forms of language at one end and certain forms of, of play within in the middle and etc cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, also. Um, I think that um, there's, it's not work for me to do, but there's also really important work that, um, I, I should say as a, as a kind of footnote to this, that um, for those of you who are not so familiar with um, the, 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 the writings of autistics, this is a very special period, I would say, a very important period, because we're seeing a generation of autistics who are classically autistic, which means that they have no speech, um, but have learned to write um, through facilitated communication mostly, um, begin to publish their own writings. And um, this has happened, we think, for all kinds of reasons, but probably mostly because of the internet. Because the, the internet allows for a very, for your own time, in terms of getting a blog post up, for example. And a lot of autistics, if you surf the autistic blogs, are writing about relations to animal, um, which are really, really interesting and not anthropomorphic at all, which have to do with autistic perception. They're also writing about relations to people with dementia. They're writing about relations to, to, to forms of intelligence that are quickly discarded, I think, in the neurotypical world. So, so maybe that, that work, um, if I were to write that book, would have to go along those lines. I'm probably with you on the cat. Side. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question. I, I, I really like your idea of counterpoint and the kind of like creation uh, of the future through the emotion. But I only know this notion. They take everything that kind of other emotion. It's not a bit of dance and movement. And while you were talking, I kept seeing flashes of Tina Bausch's work, and especially for recent, you know, there was a lot of movie film. And was like at the end, and now of course, of course I blind on the exact words, but I think at the end she says, dance, dance, for all is lost. And I was wondering what you could say a little bit more about counterpoint in relation to space rather than time, and the unfolding of space in relation to dance. I don't know, this is just kind of like that. Great question. I know my thought, but I think that's fascinating. Could, could you sort of repeat the question? Because yeah, some of the so she, words was, she was thinking about how we might think counterpoint in relation to space, um, which I think is a really interesting mm -hmm. question, and I'm going to need three days to think about it. But um, all I can say, I, I, I can give one thought that I've, I've worked with quite a bit. And, and Bill Forsyth's definition of counterpoint, the reason I quoted him and not musical definition is that Bill has worked with the musical definition, but but. Um, fleshed it out. And as a dancer, it's easier for me to work with with dance terms than with musical terms. Um, but Bill is very, very knowledgeable about music and has explained it to me via music, and particularly in terms of Baroque music, which I think is really interesting. But one of the things that, that I could say about this off the top of my head is that um, what, what Bill says is, uh, Bill Forsyth says, is that you never choreograph a body. Um, it's impossible to choreograph a body, especially if you believe in the idea of a speciation. I mean, which, how? You know? And so what could you choreograph? Well, you could choreograph what Arakawa and Gins talk about as landing sites. I don't know if you know the architects and, and, and artists Arakawa and Gins. And, and the landing sites, I, I recently had a telephone conversation with Ma Madeline Gins, who's preparing a manuscript perhaps for our series. And, and she was saying to me that um, I've written quite a bit about landing sites, and she was she was saying to me, "Well, you know, I never thought about landing sites being able to do so many things. That's what's great when you start stealing concepts and working around." And for me, spatially, landing sites work in counterpoint, and I'll explain it this way. So, if 
like working with, with a, a group of dancers. Um, and I am I'm looking for the... Uh, or I'll, I'll use... Um, so if, if, if I'm working with a series of dancers and I'm saying, okay, well look, Steve, you know, my best dancer, I'm, I want you to, um, I, I want you to land by the clock. And Brian, I want you to land in the words. And I don't mean by that, I want you to be under the clock. Land by the clock could be many, many things. It could be about the thought, it could be about the movement, but it will alter the space. And if I say to, to Brian and Steve, move and counterpoint, what will happen is that the space will move. And so one of the things I noticed when Brian and I started working with architecture is that um, as a dancer, I had no sense of the vertical horizontal axis. It didn't make sense to me because we don't work on that axis. We're always um, playing, modeling uh, gravity and, and, and working with that strange Space time before God begins, right? So, so that would be a quick answer, and then I'll some more. <laughs> I've got a question from the lawyer for fire too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, here's his question. Um, Alexander Galway suggests, quote, Heidegger claims that being in his mind, end quote, while Deleuze claims that event is mind. So what what of the ontological claim that what of the ontological claims can be made of your concept of the event without returning to the new platonic truth a la Fabio? Is there a being of the event? That's great. He has time to write this question out, right? I have to do it. Like, <laughs> <laughs> um, well, he asked yeah. me if, if I could answer. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I. I, I um, I'm obviously very influenced by Wenken's idea that that, um, that that we might hear more of that. Maybe what I'll do is I'll shift this all onto Steve, who's doing a paper on panpsychism, and you're going to talk about this, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I I I I'm very influenced by Wenken and James on the question of mind, and, and James' piece, How Two Minds Can Know One Thing, and it's 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 a really complex question that I don't think. You know, I can do on the spot, but I definitely think that um, there, the, 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 that the vocabulary that we have, for example, in, in um, uh, distributed cognition are not sufficient to understand this question, nor are um, uh, more um, Heideggerian notions of being in mind. Um, and so, you know, maybe we'll collectively think this question, it seems to me, what the non human term. Is, is edging towards, and I think uh, everybody must be really hungry. Like we have a reception to go to, and I'm sure you can hear it. It says he's watching it.